we're going to switch gears now and talk about the physiology of the GI tract. As you know, there are many hormones and secretory products that act on the GI tract, are produced by the GI tract, and interact with each other, so the information is organized into charts and diagrams to help keep things clear. We'll start with the charts and then look at the diagram shortly after. Gastrin is a very typical GI hormone. It's produced in the antrum of the stomach by G cells, G for gastrin, and it acts to increase gastric acid secretion and gastric motility. It's also trophic to the gastric mucosa, meaning it acts as a factor that promotes cell division and growth. Gastric production is increased by stomach distension or alkalinization by the arrival of amino acids or peptides, in particular phenylalanine and tryptophan, and by vagal stimulation. Production is decreased when stomach pH falls below 1.5. This is also the hormone that's highly elevated in the well-known Zollinger-Ellison syndrome, also known as gastronoma. Cholecystokinin, or CCK, is the next hormone. It's produced in the duodenum and the jejunum by eye cells. I guess eye for cholecystokinin is a good way to remember it. It increases both pancreatic secretion and gallbladder contraction and relaxes the usually contracted muscles of the sphincter of Odi, allowing those secretions to pass into the duodenum. CCK also reduces gastric emptying. Fatty acids and amino acids trigger the release of CCK, and it does act via neural muscarinic pathways to cause an increase in pancreatic secretions. Secretin is produced in the duodenum by S cells. And similarly to CCK, it works to increase secretions. Specifically, it increases pancreatic bicarbonate and bile secretion. This is important because the bicarbonate increases the pH in the duodenum so that the pancreatic enzymes are capable of functioning. In addition to the local effect of increasing pH, secretin also heads to the source in the stomach and reduces gastric acid secretion. Secretin is triggered by low pH and fatty acids. Somatostatin is a hormone produced by the D cells in pancreatic islets and the GI mucosa. We already showed you where the D cells are within the islet during the endocrinology lectures. Can you remember where they are in relation to the insulin secreting beta cells? The D or delta cells are interspersed throughout the islets, while the beta cells are located centrally. You may recall the function of somatostatin is basically to reduce the release of everything. This hormone decreases gastric acid and pepsinogen secretion. It decreases pancreatic and small intestine fluid secretion. It slows contraction of the gallbladder to reduce bile secretion, and it also acts to reduce insulin and glucagon release both. It's an inhibitory and anti-growth hormone. You can kind of guess from the name, somato coming from body and statin meaning to keep it as it is. Somatostatin release is increased by acid content, but decreased after vagal stimulation. Glucose-dependent insulinotropic peptide, also known as GIP, or gastric inhibitory peptide, is secreted from K cells in the duodenum and the jejunum. This hormone has both exocrine and endocrine functions. It decreases acid secretion and also increases insulin secretion, hence its two names. The hormones increased by fatty acids, amino acids, and oral glucose. Actually, it's the only hormone whose secretions increased by three of the four major macromolecules lipids, amino acids, and carbohydrates. Interestingly, an oral glucose load is actually used more rapidly by the body than an equivalent by IV because of this hormone. Vasoactive intestinal polypeptide, or VIP, is released from the parasympathetic ganglia in sphincters, the gallbladder, and the small intestine. It's responsible for increasing intestinal water and electrolyte secretion and relaxing the intestinal smooth muscle in sphincters. This function of increasing fluid secretion can be a source of pathology in a VIP-OMA, which presents with copious diarrhea. VIP in the normal state is increased by distension or vagal stimulation and decreased by adrenergic input. Nitric oxide is a hormone responsible for smooth muscle relaxation, including the lower esophageal sphincter. You're probably more familiar with nitric oxide and its role in the cardiovasculature. The clinical correlation is that without nitric oxide secretion, you develop achalasia. Motilin is the last hormone we'll mention and comes from the small intestine. It causes migrating motor complexes, which occur more frequently in the fasting state. Indeed, motilin receptor agonists can be used to stimulate peristalsis.
The GI tract also has a number of important secretory products, namely acid and bicarbonate, and intrinsic factor and pepsin. Intrinsic factor is produced by parietal cells in the stomach, which by the way are also the cells that produce acid, and it allows for the uptake of vitamin B12 in the terminal ileum. Autoimmune destruction of these parietal cells can cause chronic gastritis, which can lead to pernicious anemia. As I just mentioned, gastric acid is produced by those same parietal cells, and its secretion can be increased by histamine, acetylcholine, and gastrin, and increased by somatostatin, GIP, prostaglandin, and secretin. We already mentioned most of these in the last section. Gastrinoma, which we know is the same as Zollinger-Ellison syndrome, is noticed as ulcers when the very high acid content harms the stomach lining. Pepsin is another product of the stomach, though it's actually produced in the chief cells. It's required for protein digestion, and it needs acid to be converted from the inactive pepsinogen form to the active pepsin form. Pepsinogen secretion is increased by vagal stimulation or local acid. Lastly, bicarbonate, or bicarb, is produced in many different places, and of course its purpose is to neutralize the acidic secretions of the stomach so pH-sensitive enzymes can be activated. Now we'll mention salivary secretion briefly before returning to these GI secretory products. There are paired salivary glands, the major parotid glands, and the minor submandibular and sublingual glands. There's a spectrum of saliva quality, with the parotid gland producing the most serous saliva and the sublingual producing the most mucinous saliva. A mnemonic that might help you remember this is serous on the sides and mucinous in the middle. Let's pause for a moment to correlate this with a neuroscience fact. Can you remember the innervation of the salivary glands? The facial nerve, cranial nerve 7, courses through the parotid, but does not innervate the parotid. The facial nerve does innervate the sublingual and submandibular glands. The parotid itself is innervated by the glossopharyngeal nerve, cranial nerve 9. Saliva has many important functions. First and foremost, the alpha amylase begins starch digestion. This enzyme is inactivated by the low gastric pH, so carbohydrate digestion continues later on in the small intestine, as we'll review shortly. Bicarbonate in saliva is used to neutralize acid produced by oral bacteria, which helps to maintain dental health. Mucins in saliva help to lubricate food for its passage in the esophagus, and to improve oral health, there are antibacterial secretory products and growth factors that promote epithelial renewal. It's worth noting that salivary secretion is stimulated by both sympathetic and parasympathetic activity. Sympathetic innervation comes from the superior cervical ganglion, T1 to T3, and parasympathetic innervation is from the facial and glossopharyngeal nerves. When there is a low flow rate of saliva, indicating not a lot of parasympathetic stimulation, the salivary fluid is hypotonic. When the flow rate increases, the fluid is closer to isotonic because there isn't enough time for the salivary ducts to reabsorb sodium and chloride. You should also be aware that the facial nerve, cranial nerve 7, courses through the parotid gland, so the main task in surgery of the parotid gland is to avoid damaging this important nerve. Here we've got a diagram of the stomach and duodenum that we'll use to demonstrate some of the hormonal secretions. Here you can see the parietal cells, chief cells, and G cells in the stomach. If we start with a parasympathetic signal coming down the vagus nerve, we see that it will activate parietal cells as well as G cells. The parietal cells release acid in response to three stimuli, vagal acetylcholine release, gastrin from G cells that reaches the parietal cells via the circulation, and also from a histamine that's released from ECL cells in response to gastrin stimulation. This indirect gastrin effect through histamine is actually more powerful than gastrin's direct effect on parietal cells. The parietal cells are also releasing intrinsic factor. Pernicious anemia is an autoimmune disease in which the immune system attacks these parietal cells and results in vitamin B12 deficiency. The chief cells, on the other hand, release pepsinogen. Recall that pepsinogen needs the acidic environment to be converted to pepsin. A side note on the schematic is that whereas the vagus releases acetylcholine in the body of the stomach to activate parietal cells, the molecule that activates G cells in the antrum is actually GRP. You can also see here on the left side the other cell types of interest. I cells releasing CCK, S cells releasing secretin, K cells releasing GIP, and in the pancreatic islets, D cells releasing somatostatin. 